The Son of Seven Queens Today we have a book named The Son of Seven Queens by Joseph Jacobs, Short Stories for Kids. I think they're so pretty. I hope you guys really enjoy it. I love it. Please give this video a like if you enjoy it, and don't forget to subscribe for more stories. Thank you, reading. So, here we go. Once upon a time there lived a king who had seven queens but no children. This was a great grief to him, especially when he remembered that on his death there would be no heir to inherit the kingdom. Now it happened one day that a poor old beggar came to the king and said, Your prayers are heard, your desire shall be accomplished, and one of your seven queens shall bear a son. The king's delight at this promise knew no bounds, and he gave orders for appropriate celebrations to be prepared against the coming event throughout the length and breadth of the land. Meanwhile, the seven queens lived luxuriously in a splendid palace, attended by hundreds of female slaves, and fed to their hearts content on cakes and sweets. Now the king was very fond of hunting, and one day, before he started, the seven queens sent him a message saying, May it please our dearest lord not to hunt toward the north today, for we have dreamed bad dreams, and fear lest evil should befall you. The king, to stop their worries, promised to do as they wished and set out toward the south. But as luck would have it, although he hunted hard, he found nothing. Nor had he more success to the east or west, so that, being a keen sportsman and determined not to go home empty-handed, he forgot all about his promise and turned to the north. Here also he was at first unsuccessful, but just as he had made up his mind to give up for that day, a white hind, a female deer with golden horns and silver hooves flashed past him into a thicket. So quickly did it pass that he scarcely saw it. Nevertheless, a burning desire to capture and possess the beautiful strange creature filled his heart. He instantly ordered his attendants to form a ring round the thicket, and so encircle the deer. Then, gradually narrowing the circle, he pressed forward till he could distinctly see the white deer panting in the mid. Nearer and nearer he advanced, till just as he thought to lay hold of the beautiful strange creature, it gave one mighty bound, leaped clean over the king's head, and fled toward the mountains. Forgetful of all else, the king, setting spurs to his horse, followed at full speed. On, on, he galloped, leaving his party far behind, keeping the white deer in view, never slowing down until, finding himself in a narrow valley with no outlet, he reined in his steed. Before him stood a miserable hovel, into which, being tired after his long, unsuccessful chase, he entered to ask for a drink of water. An old woman, seated in the hut at a spinning wheel, answered his request by calling to her daughter, and immediately from an inner room came a maiden so lovely and charming, so white-skinned and golden-haired, that the king was transfixed by astonishment at seeing so beautiful a sight in the she held the cup of water to the king's lips, and as he drank he looked into her eyes, and then it became clear to him that the girl was no other than the white deer with the golden horns and silver feet he had chased so far. Her beauty bewitched him, so he fell on his knees, begging her to return with him as his bride. But she only laughed, saying seven queens were quite enough, even for a king to manage. However, when he would take no refusal but implored her to have pity on him, promising her everything she could desire, she replied, Give me the eyes of your seven queens, and then perhaps I may believe you mean what you say. The king was so carried away by the glamour of the white deer's magical beauty that he went home at once, had the eyes of his seven queens taken out, and, after throwing the poor blind creatures into a noisy dungeon whence they could not escape, set off once more for the hovel in the ravine, bearing. But the white deer only laughed cruelly when she saw the fourteen eyes and threading them as a necklace, 
flung it round her mother's neck, saying, Wear that little mother as a keepsake while I am away in the king's palace. Then she went back with the bewitched monarch as his bride, and he gave her the seven queens' rich clothes and jewels to wear, the seven queens' palace to live in, and the seven queens' slaves to wait upon her, so that she really had everything even a witch could desire. Now, very soon after the seven wretched, hapless queens had their eyes torn out and were cast into prison, a baby was born to the youngest of the queens. It was a handsome boy, but the other queens were very jealous that the youngest among them should be so fortunate. But though at first they disliked the handsome little boy, he soon proved so useful to them that before long they all looked on him as their son. Almost as soon as he could walk about, he began scraping at the mud wall of their dungeon, and in an incredibly short space of time had made a hole big enough for him to crawl through. Through this, he disappeared returning in an hour or so laden with food, which he divided equally among the seven blind queens. As he grew older, he enlarged the hole and slipped out two or three times every day to play with the little nobles in the town. No one knew who the tiny boy was, but everybody liked him, and he was so full of funny tricks and antics, so merry and bright, that he was sure to be rewarded by some cakes, a handful of grain, or some other nice food. All these things he brought home to his seven mothers, as he loved to call the seven blind queens, who by his help lived on in their dungeon when all the world thought they had starved to death ages before. At last, when he was quite a big lad, he one day took his bow and arrow and went out to seek for game. Coming by chance past the palace where the white deer lived in wicked splendor and magnificence, he saw some pigeons fluttering around the white marble turrets and, taking good aim, shot one dead. He came tumbling past the very window where the white queen was sitting. She rose to see what was the matter and looked out. At the first glance of the handsome young lad standing there bow in hand, she knew by her witchcraft that it was the king's son. She nearly died of jealousy and spite determining to destroy the lad without delay. Therefore, sending a servant to bring him to her presence, she asked him if he would sell her the pigeon he had just shot. No, replied the sturdy lad. The pigeon is for my seven blind mothers, who live in the noisy dungeon, and who would die if I did not bring them food. Poor souls, cried the cunning white wit. Would you not like to bring them their eyes again? Give me the pigeon, my dear, and I faithfully promise to show you where to find them. Hearing this, the lad was delighted beyond measure, and gave up the pigeon at once. Whereupon the white queen told him to seek her mother without delay, and ask for the eyes which she wore as a necklace. She will not fail to give them, said the cruel queen, if you show her this token on which I have written what I want done. So saying, she gave the lad a piece of a broken pot with these words inscribed on it, Kill the bearer at once, and sprinkle his blood like water. Now, as the son of seven queens could not read, he took the fatal message cheerfully and set off to find the white queen's mother. While he was journeying, he passed through a town where every one of the inhabitants looked so sad that he could not help asking what was the matter. They told him it was because the king's only daughter refused to marry. Therefore, when her father died, there would be no heir to the throne. They greatly feared she must be out of her mind, for though every good-looking young man in the kingdom had been shown to her, she declared she would only marry one who was the son of seven mothers, and who had ever heard of such a thing. So, much to the lad's impatience, for he was in an immense hurry to find his mother's eyes, he was dragged into the presence chamber. No sooner did the princess catch sight of him than she blushed, and turning to the king said, Dear father, this is my choice. Never were such rejoicings as these few words produced. The inhabitants nearly went wild with joy. 
but the son of seven queens said he would not marry the princess unless they first let him recover his mother's eyes. When the beautiful bride heard his story, she asked to see the pot fragment, for she was very learned and clever. Seeing the treacherous words, she said nothing, but taking another similar-shaped bit of a pot, she wrote on it these words, Take care of this lad, giving him all he desires, and returned it to the son of seven queens, who, none the wiser, set off on his quest. Before long he arrived at the hovel in the narrow veli where the white witch's mother, a hideous old creature, grumbled dreadfully on reading the message, especially when the lad asked for the necklace of eyes. Nevertheless she took it off and gave it him, saying, There are only thirteen of them now, for I lost one last week. The lad, however, was only too glad to get any at all, so he hurried home as fast as he could to his seven mothers and gave two eyes apiece to the six elder queens. But to the youngest he gave one, saying, Dearest little mother, I will be your other eye always. After this he set off to marry the princess, as he had promised, but when passing by the white queen's palace he saw some pigeons on the roof. Drawing his bow he shot one, and it came fluttering past the window. The white deer queen looked out, and lo, there was the king's son, alive and well. She cried with hatred and disgust, but sending for the lad asked him how he had returned so soon, and when she heard how he had brought home the thirteen eyes and given them to the seven blind queens, she could hardly restrain her rage. Nevertheless, she pretended to be charmed with his success, and told him that if he would give her this pigeon also, she would reward him with a wonderful cow, whose milk flows all day long, and makes a pond as big as a kingdom. She told him the cow belonged to the yogi, king of the demon. The lad, without hesitation, gave her the pigeon. Whereupon, as before, she told him, Go and ask her mother for the cow, and gave him another piece of a pot whereon was written, Kill this lad without fail, and sprinkle his blood like water. But on the way, the son of seven queens looked in on the princess, just to tell her how he came to be delayed, and she, after reading the message on the pot piece, gave him another instead. So that when the lad reached the old hag's hut and asked her for the jogi's cow, she could not refuse, but instructed the boy in how to obtain it and telling him of all things not to be afraid of the eighteen thousand demons who kept watch over the treasure, told him to be off before she became too angry at her daughter's foolishness in giving away so many good things. Then the lad bravely did as he had been told. He journeyed on and on till he came to a milk-white pond guarded by the eighteen thousand demons. They were really frightful to behold, but plucking up courage, he whistled a tune as he walked through them, looking neither to the right nor the left. By and by he came upon the cow, tall, white, and beautiful, while the jogi himself, king of all the demons, sat milking her day and night, and the milk streamed from her udder, filling the milk, white tank. The jogi, seeing the lad, called out fiercely, What do you want here? Then the lad answered, According to the old hag's instructions, I want your skin, for King Indra is making a new drum and says your skin is nice and tough. Upon this the jogi began to shiver and shake, for no jogi dares disobey King Indra's command, and, falling at the lad's feet, cried, If you will spare me, I will give you anything I possess, even my beautiful white cow. To this the son of seven queens, after a little pretended hesitation, agreed, saying that after all it would not be difficult to find a nice tough skin like the jogis elsewhere. So driving the wonderful cow before him, he set off homeward. The seven queens were delighted to possess so marvelous an animal, and though they toiled from morning till night making curds and whey, besides selling milk to the confectioners, they could not use half the cow gave, and became richer and richer day by day. Seeing them so comfortably off, the son of seven queens started with a light heart to marry the princess. 
But when passing the White Deer's palace, he could not resist sending a bolt at some pigeons that were cooing on the roof. One fell dead, just beneath the window where the White Queen was sitting. Looking out, she saw the lad, hale and hardy, standing before her, and grew whiter than ever with rage and spite. She sent for him to ask how he had returned so soon, and when she heard how kindly her mother had received him, she very nearly had a fit. However, she hid her feelings as well as she could, and smiling sweetly said she was glad to have been able to fulfill her promise, and that if he would give her this third pigeon, she would do yet more for him than she had done before by giving him the millionfold rice, which ripens in one night. The lad was of course delighted at the very idea, and giving up the pigeon, set off on his quest, armed as before with a piece of pot, on which was written, Do not fail this time. Kill the lad and sprinkle his blood like water? But when he looked in on his princess, just to prevent her becoming anxious about him, she asked to see the fragment as usual, and substituted another, on which was written, Yet again give this lad all he requires, for his blood shall be as your blood. Now when the old hag saw this, and heard how the lad wanted the millionfold rice, which ripens in a single night, she fell into the most furious rage, but being terribly afraid of her daughter, she controlled herself and told the boy go and find the field guarded by eighteen millions of demons. So the son of seven queens set off, and soon came to the field where, guarded by eighteen millions of demons, the millionfold rice grew. He walked on bravely, looking neither to the right nor left, till he reached the center and plucked the tallest ear. But as he turned homeward, a thousand sweet voices rose behind him, crying in tenderest accents, Pluck me too. Hey, he looked back, and lo, please pluck me too. He looked back, and lo. Now as time passed by, and the lad did not return, the old hag grew uneasy, remembering the message, His blood shall be as your blood. So she set off to see what had happened. Soon she came to the heap of ashes, and knowing by her arts what it was, she took a little water, and kneading the ashes into a paste, formed it into the likeness of a man. Then putting a drop of blood from her little finger into its mouth, she blew on it, and instantly the son of seven queens started up as well as ever. Don't you disobey orders again, grumbled the old hag, or next time I'll leave you alone. Now be off before I repent of my kindness. So the son of seven queens returned joyfully to his seven mothers, who by the aid of the millionfold rice soon became the richest people in the kingdom. Then they celebrated their son's marriage to the clever princess with all imaginable pomp. But the bride was so clever, she would not rest until she had made known her husband to his father and punished the wicked white witch. So she made her husband build a palace exactly like the one in which the seven queens had lived, and in which the white witch now dwelt in splendor. Then, when all was prepared, she asked her husband give a grand feast to the king. Now the king had heard much of the mysterious son of seven queens, and his marvelous wealth, so he gladly accepted the invitation. But what was his astonishment when on entering the palace he found it was identical to his own in every way? Then the king awoke from his enchantment, and his anger rose against the wicked white deer queen who had bewitched him so long, until he could not contain himself. So she was banished forever, and after that, the seven queens returned to their own splendid palace, and everybody lived happily. The End Good job, friends. Thank you so much for reading with me. Bye, I'll see you next time.